I just stopped by Green Dragon Nursery and picked up some clones. But before I did that, I set up this tent because environment's gonna be the most important part of this grow. I love using grow tents. They're easy to set up and self-contained. They come with all the necessary ports to exchange air or run wiring. They have reflective interiors, they're light proof for the most part, and they're sort of stealth. It's hard to tell what this is when it's zipped up. I use a centrifugal fan to exhaust the air out of the tent. These type of fans are powerful and produce enough pressure to overcome the tightly packed carbon inside my filter. A regular duct fan is not going to work as well. This type of filter absorbs odors. They work pretty well and can remove up to 90% of the smell, but they also have a lifespan. So I'm going to leave this disconnected until I really need it. And this is going to help prolong the life of this filter. Although it's kind of small and I don't see this one going past this grow. This digital controller manages my exhaust fan. It really just triggers on and off, and that doesn't really do much for my application, so I just leave it on on with the fan speed at two. The air exhausts out the window, and I know this looks crazy, but growing is my life, and at this point, I really don't care. This is the Mars FCE 6500. It's the perfect size for this room. Got to set the 50% because those clones aren't going to need that much light at this time. The light is connected to an outdoor timer. The timer is set to 16 hours on and 8 hours off. I've also got three circulation fans inside the tent, and these are going to move around stagnated air, cool down leaf surfaces, and create movement in the plant to strengthen those stems. I've also got an AC unit hooked up to a controller, and this will come on if my room gets over 83 degrees. Ideal temperature at this stage for me is 75 to 80. Humidity, 60 to 70. I'm gonna show you how I mix up my soil. But before we do that, I think we have to talk about what soil is. So we're gonna to have to take a little field trip. This is Stony Point Park. Stony Point Park is an outcrop of bedrock. And bedrock is important because it's the mother material of all soils. It begins with a solid rock. Weathering begins the process of erosion. With time, the rock starts to crack and chunks can even fall off. But on top of that, specialized microbes begin to grow on the rock and begin to decompose it. They extract the nutrients they need and convert the rest of it into organic matter. And that's the beginning because now plants can grow. Eventually the area turns to grasslands. Animal and insects live on the land, leave waste behind, and eventually die and decompose. And the organic matter continues to build, and eventually, forests are formed. And Stony Point Park's a beautiful place because the formation of soil is happening right before our eyes. Erosion. Decomposing of the rock by microbial activity and even the formation of plants on the rock surface. So the basic definition of soil is decomposed bedrock and organic matter in different stages of decomposition. And I know this sounds great and the images that I shot are beautiful, but what does that have to do with indoor growers? And how does that relate to my store-bought soil mix? And better yet, is it even soil? Soilless medium is meant to simulate the characteristics of soil. But what are the characteristics of soil? And why do your plants need it? You see, soil absorbs and holds water, but there's also pockets of air and oxygen at root level. Soil provides a home for microbes and small insects. Soil has organic matter that decomposes and feeds the microbes and insects. And on top of all that, it's able to attract and hold on to mineral nutrients long enough for the roots to reach them and absorb them. And this is called the cation exchange capacity of a material. The soilless mixes that I can get in my area usually have a base of peat moss, cocoa core. That's because both of these materials hold water really well. They have a high cation exchange capacity and they take a really long time to decompose. There are some differences though. Peat moss is really acidic and cocoa is just really close to neutral. Peat moss sort of buffers everything evenly and cocoa loves calcium and magnesium a whole lot. Enough to steal it from your plant if there's not enough in the soil. It doesn't really hold on to any other nutrients. But of course, store-bought soil mixes are already pre-buffered and adjusted. Peat moss with lime and cocoa with calcium nitrate and magnesium sulfate. So the main purpose of peat moss and cocoa is to hold on to water and retain nutrients. 
but you also have to find a way to create air pockets so that anaerobic microbes don't grow and your roots don't rot. It doesn't really matter what you use, but the most common material in these soilless mixes is perlite. And like I said, you could use anything, vermiculite, pumice, you can use Lego pieces if you wanted to. The other ingredient that's necessary is organic matter. Compost is mostly decomposed organic matter and it's got a load of microbes. Earthworm castings are worm poop. They're also loaded with microbes. And it's also loaded with worm gut enzymes that help break things down. An added benefit to using these two materials is that it retains a lot of water. And they usually have a pH of seven, which can naturally help balance out the acidic peat moss. But you can also find organic matter in the form of dry amendments. It's pretty much dehydrated organic matter. And this stuff can help boost up your NPK and provide the food that your microbes need to really flourish. Water, air, organic matter, and microbes. So let's mix up a batch real quick. I've been using Fox Farm Motion Forest Soil for over 10 years. I plant seeds directly into it, transplant clones into it, and I've never had a problem. Honestly, there's only three reasons why I stuck to this brand. One, familiarity. Two, I like the organic ingredients. And three, I really, really like the texture. The compost I'm using is not really the best. It's made by a company called Kellogg's. It's mostly composted wood and it has some composted chicken manure as well. Homemade compost is way better because it's richer in microbes, but I have a very small batch right now and it's not enough to make a mix yet. This mix makes 13 to 14 gallons. I mixed it up really well and put the soil into seven gallon pots. I then watered it with reverse osmosis filtered water. I wanna make sure there's water in the soil before I transplant. Mycorrhizae is a natural beneficial fungus that creates a symbiotic relationship with your plant. They say that mycorrhiza is attached to 99% of the plants on earth. Now the way it works is fungal spores attach to your plant's roots. There they start to grow. Some of them penetrate the root and grow on the inside and others just sit right on top. But the reason why they're so dope is because they create web-like structures, almost like roots. And because they're a fungus, you're able to break down organic matter, convert it into a plant usable nutrient and absorb it. Your plant creates carbohydrates through the process of photosynthesis. And it uses these carbohydrates like energy, almost like food. The carbohydrates it doesn't use, it stores in the roots. But it also trades these carbohydrates for the mineral nutrients that the mycorrhiza dissolved and absorbed. I planted the clone into the soil, then watered it down a little bit with reverse osmosis filtered water. The water is going to compact the soil around the Rockwell Cube. The Mars Hydro FCE6500 is set to a vegetative light cycle, 16 hours on, and eight hours off. These green dragon nursery clones are healthy and beautiful. I'm paying really close attention to the structure. All four of these are clones, but they're still gonna grow differently because the structure's different. And I want them all to be as even as possible. Man. That was rough. It took these clones a few days to settle into their soil. Had me worried up until day four. Some of those older leaves took some major damage. I'm glad we got past that. All the new growth is looking really good, so. I haven't watered since I transplanted. The soil's been retaining that moisture really well. Knowing when to water is one of the hardest things to learn. It's something that you just know. It has to do with the way the soil and the leaves look, but it's just a little hard for me to explain. There's nothing wrong with using a moisture meter. I use one every once in a while just to double check myself. I mix two milliliters of seaweed extract and one quart of reverse osmosis filtered water. I'm gonna use this as a foliar spray, mostly to keep the humidity up, but also to take advantage of the seaweed extract hormones. I spray this on the plants once or twice a day. Now some of these clones are getting kind of tall. They're not growing evenly. The clone on the back left is the tallest. Now most plants grow vertically at the apocomera stem. Yeah. 
side branches are created, but they don't grow as fast as the apical. This is because all the growth hormones are concentrated at that apical meristem. Now, if you were to cut that apical meristem, not only will that plant replace the main leading stem with two main leading stems, but all the hormones that it was once receiving will then flow to all the other apicals below the main. Now, while the plant's repairing itself, all the other apicals that were growing very slow will begin to grow a little bit faster and catch up to the top. So I'm gonna to top this plant not only to slow its growth, but also to bush it out a little bit. These are ceramic watering plugs. They're real simple, but they work really well. The ceramic piece is porous, and this allows water to flow in and out. When the soil is dry, it pulls water from inside that plug. The plug has a cap with a tube connected to it. When the soil pulls water, it creates suction, and the tube pulls fresh water from your water reservoir, and that can be pretty much any container. I'm using a one liter measuring container. I filled it with reverse osmosis filtered water. AC just took a shit on me. I'm gonna have to turn down the lights. Damn. I'm pretty much in disaster control mode at this point. I plugged in a small four inch intake fan in place of the air conditioner for now. The fan pulls air from outside the house. It's connected to a temperature controller and it only comes on if the temperature is below 73 degrees. So I'm pretty much at the mercy of my local weather. I'm still in the vegetative stage so the plants can handle higher temperatures. Day number 19, the plants are doing really good, but I've struggled hard with those temperatures for the last three days. Today I picked up a new air conditioner unit. The last one I had was 10,000 BTU. This one's only five, so it's taking that room a lot longer to cool down. I've kept the light at a lower intensity, and this has caused a little bit of a stretch on the plant, but not as much as I thought it would. We're still doing okay. The results of the topping I did are starting to show. Unfortunately, I'm on a time schedule on this one, so we may not be able to take full advantage of topping on this grow. Today, I'm gonna hang up a trellis net. The trellis net's gonna help me train the plant, but it's also gonna provide support when those flowers get big and heavy. I got this one at Daiso Japan in Little Tokyo. It was only about a buck 50. Sometimes you find some really good stuff here. If you buy one online, I recommend that the squares not be bigger than three and a half inches. I try to keep it as simple as possible. I use zip ties to hang the net to the post. I try to pull the net as tight as possible, and I also leave a little slack in the zip tie. This allows me to tighten it up more in the future if I need to, and also move it up and down. The goal is to try to create an even canopy. You do this by holding down the branches that grow past the trellis. This allows the lower branches time to develop and catch up. Cannabis plants are photosensitive. This means that the type of hormones that the plant creates are directly affected by the light or lack of. When the plant receives long periods of light, it produces a type of hormones that causes a lot of leaf and branch development. During the dark cycle, the plant produces and builds up the type of hormones that signals flowering stage. And if the concentrations of these type of hormones are enough, the plant starts to produce flowers. In nature, this happens with the changing of the seasons. Days become shorter and nights become longer. Indoor, all we have to do is adjust the timer. The plant will now receive 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Day number 24. It's been four days since I changed the light cycle. The next few days is just about training and trying to control those fast growing branches that grow up past the trellis. Clones flower a lot quicker than plants from seeds. You can see the pistil and crown starting to form. This is because the mother plant was already pretty old, so these clones are ready to go. Four weeks ago, I went to the beach and collected seaweed off the shore. I washed off a lot of the salts and composted a lot of it using an old Native American technique. 
It didn't take very long for it to completely break down. I'm gonna make about two gallons of compost tea. I used one cup of seaweed compost and one cup of regular compost. My regular compost is mostly made of kitchen scraps. I took my time and picked out all the earthworms. I don't want to drown these guys, they're valuable. I'm using a paint strainer bag to hold the compost inside the bucket. And this is just to make sure I can suspend it in the water and it doesn't just sit at the bottom of the bucket and become anaerobic. I gave it a couple of dunks to make sure it wet the compost really well. I added two tablespoons of seaweed extract and about a teaspoon per gallon of rhizomix. I'm using rhizomix for the carbs. And yes, the mycorrhiza will survive in the water for 48 hours. The carbs are the most important part though. They're food for the microbes. A good alternative would be molasses or plain sugar. This is gonna brew for 48 hours uninterrupted. Day number 26, the plants are looking beautiful. They're growing fast too, so I've had to train them under the trellis on a daily. They're healthy, lush green, and not showing any deficiencies. These clones are a little awkward though, and some of these plants have fast growing branches that I have to bend just to prevent them from growing too fast. I try not to damage the branches though. When the branches are young like this, they're very malleable. The plants have lots of growth along the branches. These are called apicals, and they're pretty much using the plant's energy. If I was to leave these, and we had enough time, they would grow in the branches. But we don't have time, and all these guys are doing are slowing down the rest of the plant. When they're young enough, you can just pick them off by hand. As they get older, the branches get a little thicker, and it's probably a good idea to use shears. You can get the Cali Green shears on my Patreon. They're not any more special than any other shears, but they work. And you also support my efforts. This is a 5x5 five five grow tent, and it's really difficult to reach the plants in the back. And sometimes, you just got to get in here and take care of business, because you just got to do it, man. Day number 27, that compost tea is looking great. I poured it into my pump sprayer using a cone paper paint strainer. This is gonna filter out any large particles that can clog up my pump sprayer. I then watered each one of my plants slowly. By day 33, the plant started showing a deficiency. But I didn't notice it until day 36. I personally like to grow in larger pots, and I consider anything above 10 gallons to be larger. Um, small pots like this, I really don't like too much because change can happen very quickly in small pots. You know, temperature can fluctuate very quickly, the moisture level fluctuates very quickly, and I don't know if there wasn't enough magnesium or calcium in the soil mix, because I'm always changing the soil mix. I, I never keep it the same. I'm always trying new things. Was it something I did or didn't do? Or was it the soil mix? I don't know. What I do know is that I gotta get this fixed and I gotta find a way of doing it organically. So when it comes to providing nutrients to an organic grow, I have a few options. Option number one, I can use an organic amendment like earth dust. Option number two, I can use compost. Now the problem with compost is that I don't know exactly what the nutritional value is, but compost is loaded with all sorts of microbes and I'm sure it's loaded with some really good nutrients. But the other thing I gotta consider is that all the other nutrients may be on point and the only ones that I'm lacking 
are going to be calcium and magnesium. And if that's the case, then I can treat it organically as well. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. And what I usually like to do is mix a half a teaspoon per uh, quart of water into a, a spray bottle and spray the leaves directly. And you can use milk for calcium. Not only does milk have the benefit of the calcium, but it's also antifungal. I like to mix in a tablespoon per quart. Another organic fertilizer option is JDAM liquid fertilizer. This is about a month old. But all this liquid here, it's gold. The JDAM liquid fertilizer takes on the nutrients of whatever you made it from. So if you made it from grass, it's gonna be high in nitrogen and iron. If you made it from seaweed, it's gonna have all the nutrients that seaweed has, including calcium and magnesium. But this batch is new and I've never used it before. So before I use it on my indoor plant, I'm gonna test it on one of these outdoor plants. So what I decided to do is mix in one cup of earth dust into four quarts of compost. I know you guys see that little guy right there. By the way, that's my Nicaraguan neighbor bumping his shit right now, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> now the reason why I decided to top dress like this is because organic amendments are pretty gentle. I know it's not gonna burn my plant, and it's really rare to have toxicity or excess. This compost is a little chunky. It still has pieces of branches that haven't fully decomposed yet. And fungi love that shit. So that deficiency actually kept going a few more days after I added the compost. You know, in organics, it actually takes a while for things to happen. There's a process, you know, the microbes have to break down organic matter before those nutrients are released. And that's what we're seeing here because they're much better now and I'm a little bit less worried, but uh, for a while I was sweating, trust me. I, I mean, I'm on video here, you know, so I gotta make sure that I complete these grows. So if you notice, the top of the plant is perfectly green and lush, and the only parts that are having problems are the lower part of the plant, like these older leaves. And that's very important to pay attention to. Some nutrients are mobile, and others immobile. And this just means that plants are able to move nutrients around from leaves to leaves. And for the most part, the priority is the new growth. And the plant will move mobile nutrients from the older growth to the newer growth. This is why only the lower leaves were affected. I usually don't remove leaves with discoloration because it helps me gauge how fast it's moving and how bad it really is. You know, I'm not completely out the woods though. I can still mess this up pretty bad. I'm on week six. I got about three weeks to go. So I got to make sure I'm on point. I think it's also important to know that even though I fix this problem, there's going to be lingering effects and I'm probably not going to get the harvest that I would have gotten if everything would have gone right. Today, I'm gonna to top dress with a mixture of compost and earth dust, again. I also tested that JDAM liquid fertilizer and it seems to be okay. So I'm gonna use that as well.
few days later I noticed I didn't completely resolve the deficiency issue. And although it was progressing slow, it was still progressing. But by this time I was already 8 weeks in, and this plant's only supposed to go about 9 weeks. So I didn't really want to add any amendments, and I kind of just want to let it fade out. On day 59 I took the plant outside the tent to take a closer look. Definitely lacking magnesium, but I didn't see any other deficiencies. Maybe slight nitrogen. The flowers look amazing though. They're just kind of small. I usually don't do this, but the comments section got to me. I do read your comments guys. A lot of you were curious about the pH, and I don't normally check pH because I don't usually have issues, in bigger pots anyway. And since I've had some problems with these plants, I thought I'd take a look. I'm always open to new ideas and willing to try new things. So I ran water through the pot and collected the runoff. I tested the pH and it was 7.2. I then looked up a chart and saw that most nutrients are within range at this pH. So it was definitely lacking in the mix. Now it could be that I have to amend often because of the size of the pot. I don't know, I've never grown in pot sizes this small, it's usually 10 gallons or bigger for me. It could have also been an environmental issue, I could have let the soil dry out too much or maybe it was too wet. Or it could be the strain really loves magnesium. <laughs> I don't know. What I do know is that I finally got a challenge. And if Green Dragon Nursery releases these again, I'm definitely going to pick them up. Day number 68. Today is harvest day. The plants faded out pretty good. And the magnesium problem, it's hard to see now because <laughs> everything else is lacking too, which is good. I don't want excessive nutrients inside the plant when I harvest. Some people say that it makes harsh smoke. I've noticed the same, but I really don't know if it's true or just wishful thinking. Plus, I've only been smoking my shit for the last 10 years. I tried to pull the net off the plant, but I was damaging those flowers. And the last thing I want to do is crush those trichomes. So I said, fuck it, and I just cut it off. The tent was pretty dirty when I took those plants out. I'm gonna dry in this room, so I gotta make sure it's super clean. I vacuumed and then disinfected using a bleach and water solution. Afterwards, I turned on the exhaust fan and all the circulating fans so it dries up and airs out. While that was happening, I started to defoliate my plant. I only removed the big fan leaves. If it was too close to the flower, I just left them alone. As you can see in this pile, it was just a very light trimming. Nothing too aggressive. And this stuff right here is gold, so I threw it in my compost bin. And it's gonna feed my next round of plants. Then I hung all the plants whole using bonsai wires. Low tech is the best tech, baby. I added a second carbon filter inside the tent. This one's gonna recirculate the air inside the tent. It's set to a very low setting. I don't want it to be excessive air turbulence in here drying out my flowers too quickly. The exhaust fan is also set to a very low setting. These plants are gonna sit in here 14 to 20 days. Temperature and humidity is critical at this stage. We don't wanna vaporize terpenes and we don't wanna dry so quickly that we get crumbly flowers. I'm keeping the tent 65 to 70, humidity 60%. Lights off. These plants have been drying in here for six days and they've dried quite a bit, but just not quite enough. Let me show you how they're doing. So how do I know if they're dry enough? Well, the leaves and branches are gonna tell you. You see how this is stuck to the flower and I move it around, it's still kind of leathery, it's not pulling away. Well, if it was dry, it would snap right away. So what that's telling me is that there's still moisture in that stem, which means there's still moisture inside that flower. And I think that's where all the new growers get into trouble because They'll feel the outside of the flower, it'll feel dry, but the inside still has a lot of moisture in it. And what they'll do is they'll take these flowers down, they'll throw them into jars, and they're just way too wet. So my goal is to try to dry this flower down as much as I can. I still want moisture on the inside, but not a lot, because what I'm gonna do in the curing process is draw the rest of that moisture out. 
and distribute it evenly throughout the other flowers. And that's another reason why I'm drying so slow because I, if I dry too quickly, they're gonna get brittle and they're gonna dry up and, and it's, it's gonna be bad. So by now you guys have noticed that Mars Hydro is the sponsor to this whole series. So I wanna take a quick moment to thank uh, Mars Hydro for sponsoring the show. I really appreciate it. You know, and I can easily turn this light on to give you a better view. It works, it's connected, but I wanna to try to avoid that because there's only a few things that'll damage uh, the trichomes and, and those valuable chemicals that you're trying to harvest. Light is one of them. You wanna to try to avoid light because it degrades the THC and all the other active chemicals that are in those trichomes. Another thing to watch out for when you're drying is excessive heat because some of these chemicals, they vaporize at very low temperatures. Some terpenes vaporize at 73 degrees. So that's one of the reasons why we're keeping it so low in here because we don't want those precious terpenes to vaporize. We want to taste them. And the last thing that I'm really, really careful with is handling these flowers because I don't want to crush those trichomes and expose those oils because then they'll oxidize. And if they oxidize, they also degrade. And since we're talking, let me tell you about my other channel. It's called LA Guy. It has nothing to do with cannabis, although you know what's going on in the background. But pretty much what I'm doing is just walking around the city and showing you, you know, my habitat, my natural habitat. So, <laughs> but I would really appreciate it if you check out the video, subscribe. It would really mean a lot. The link is in the description section of the video, right, right down there. You just kind of scroll up, and you'll see it down there. It'll say. I don't know what it's gonna say. It's gonna say something like YouTube slash LA guy or something like that. Just click that. So it's been about 17 days since we harvested these plants and hung them up to dry. So let's check them out and see how they're doing. start by trimming off the fan leaves. These break off real easily. I avoid touching those flowers. I don't want to crush or damage those trichomes. So I keep the flowers on the stem as long as possible to avoid touching them too much. This is a long, tedious process, but I have to do it this way. I put in too much hard work just to throw it away now. Once the fan leaves have been removed, I work on the individual flowers, and I'm really just cleaning them up, removing some of those small leaves while avoiding damaging the flower. So the harvest weight isn't really that much, but the quality of the flower is fucking awesome. And when I'm done trimming, I move on to the next step, the curing process. In the curing process, I'm trying to draw out the moisture deep within the flower and redistribute it evenly not only to that individual flower, but every other flower within that container. You see, this enclosed space creates a microenvironment, and it allows me to control the humidity within that container really well. The sea vaults have a built-in shelf used for hydration packets. I personally don't use those, but this is also a great place to put your temperature monitors. I keep my humidity in here between 50 and 55. Some people like 60%. If the humidity climbs above 55, I open up the container and allow fresh air to come in. And I continue to do this until the humidity inside the container evens out. If you're not growing your own, you probably don't have access to trim. Trim can be used to make edibles and even extract if you're ambitious enough. You also have access to keef, which is also very smokable and tastes great. crazy though is that I've been smoking since 1995 and your boys still don't know how to fucking roll a joint. Well guys, that's the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, I want to thank you for watching, commenting, and subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Don't forget to check out the links in the description section of this video. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Patreon. And if you like this video, click like. Peace.